So lab, lab today, lab this week, uh, we'll look at some more uh, lighting helmets and diagenes. <clears throat> we'll probably do a comparison uh, to the spe species that you drew uh, last week. Kind of look at the rest of the platy helmets that we have the adults anyways uh, and see similarities, differences. Uh, you should be able to identify different structures. Uh, just like looking at the worms, uh, having to find a diagram of them, should be able to start to identify that stuff. What we're going to do uh, for lecture is finish up this immunology section and then start with the introduction of body helmets. Uh, hopefully, I don't know, if I think we'll get through all of that today. And then on Wednesday, we'll do uh, Spitabotherians. Probably I'll get through it. And then uh, di diagenes, like intro to diagenes. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how, how fast we go. <clears throat> so uh, we, we left off with this inflammation. Uh, left off with inflammation because it's going to be an important player in our parasitic infections. All right. Anytime we get inflammation, it's going to be a sign of innate immunity. All right. It's going to be a sign that the body is calling in extra cells to try to control or clear out an infection. In some cases, the parasites will use this response to their advantage, to their benefit. We'll see that uh, shortly. All right. Now, the type of inflammation we can have is an immediate type response or a delayed type response. So the, the delayed type hypersensitivity reaction is a response that, that takes more than 24 hours. All right, this isn't something where you get nailed and then all of a sudden you start responding. It takes a while before you start to see the actual response. All right, what are the major players in a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction? The big one is tumor necrosis factor, TNF. All right. This whole TNF compound is going to promote the adhesion of leukocytes to the blood vessel endothelial cells. All right, so it's, it's going to call in neutrophils first, and then you start getting lymphocytes and monocytes coming in. All right, the other thing is that this TNF stimulates the endothelium to start, secre start secreting inflammatory cytokines. So uh, TNF is kind of itself increasing uh, the call for additional additional cells to come through. Now, what this does, this cytokine, this IL-8, is going to allow for increased mobility of our leukocytes and facilitate their passage through the, through the endothelium. So as you'll learn, our blood vessel endothelial cells can actually kind of expand and loosen up and in some cases can kind of grow over structures. So what we're doing is allowing our blood vessels to become a little bit more, to have a little bit more leakage. And that allows the cells to get out of the circulation, out of the circulatory system and actually into the tissue. All right, that's kind of associated with some swelling usually. Um, that's oftentimes what you, you typically, typically see. Now, tumor necrosis factor and interferon gamma are going to work together to induce these changes in the shape of the endothelial cells that also helps to allow leakage. And then our monocytes then can kind of get through and act as the main effectors, as like the primary responders in this type of response. What they're gonna do is try to phagocytize our, our invaders, our antigen. They're going to secrete mediators, uh, additional cytokines and other growth factors that also kind of promote this clearance, this destruction in, in the clearance. If you have these monocytes coming in there to try to uh, clear out the antigen, and the antigen is too big, so let's say you have a splinter, for example, all right? It's pretty big, a cell's not gonna phagocytize it. What it'll do is you, it, all of these cells will come in and start to encapsulate it and isolate it from the rest of the body, and that encapsulated item is called a granuloma. So the granuloma specifically is a nodule of inflammatory tissue, but it's the body's way of trying to wall off that invader from the rest of the body, so that way everything is being contained. We're going to see the importance of a granuloma uh, in at least one of our parasites. So this type of response takes more than 24 hours to develop. An immediate hypersensitivity response, however, is pretty much immediate. And I'm sure you've seen videos or you know someone that is highly uh, allergic to, to certain compounds, um, 
Yeah, I just remember it. I remember an old movie with Martin Short where he gets stung by a bee and he just swells up drastically. I'm trying to remember what movie that was. It was, I don't know, 80s, easy, uh, maybe early 90s. Uh, but that's an immediate hypersensitivity. You got stung, and within you know minutes, all of a sudden, you start having this type of response. Why do we get this response? Well, it's from the mast cells. The mast cells, these granulated cells, are going to degranulate. They're going to dump their com compounds, such as histamine, and all of a sudden, that's going to cause this huge increase in, uh, in our inflammation. So it's almost like instantaneous, all right? The characteristics of this type of response is wheel, flare, and anaphylaxis. So wheel is a swelling caused by the blood plasma escaping from the vascular system into surrounding tissue. This is a very rapid swelling. All right. Flare is the redness. It's caused by the engorgement of these blood vessels. So these blood vessels are responding. They're becoming leakier because of the inflammation response, they're enlarging to increase blood flow to that area, so you get the wheel, and then also the flare uh, associated, that redness. And then, worst case scenario is this anaphylaxis, which is the widespread systemic type of response. Basically, your entire body goes into this, this process, which could ultimately lead to death if not treated very quickly. All right? When we have this immediate hypersensitivity reaction, some necrosis will always occur. Right? Our inflammatory response kicks up. Some of our cells are going to die. Right? And when this happens, it could form an abscess or it could form an ulcer. All right? Some of this is going to be due by parasites. Not necessarily the parasites causing the damage, but the inflammation response to the parasite that causes its death. So an abscess would be that localized area that has high, high hydrostatic pressure, you know, due to pus that's developing inside of it, and then an open an ulcer is basically an open wound. So it could be an open wound on the surface of our skin. We'll see a parasite that does that, uh, or it could be an ulcer that's inside uh, inside our body, often gastrointestinal tract. Um, and it's you know I, I used allergies as ex as as an example, but yeah, allergies. Uh, this is the basis for allergies and also for asthma, why you get this rapid onset. Yep. Um, so, because you can have such like serious reactions, like people like die of like allergic reactions and stuff like that, are there like um, positives to such immediate um, like hypersensitivity as opposed to like the 24 hour period? Are there positives? Yeah, that? are there any positives? Uh, I don't know, good question. Uh, I guess it, it's a rapid response. It's a rapid response, but you know, oftentimes these things, it doesn't just turn on and then turn off right away. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just curious. Next time immunology happens, you should ask. I can't think of a positive. Doesn't mean there isn't one. All right, so uh, that's the immunology. Introduction, kind of use the FYI. We're going to see this stuff reappear. We're going to use these terms again. Um, when we get to those terms, we'll define them then. So, you know, don't panic and think you have to memorize these terms or know their definitions. We'll, we'll, we'll go over them again when we see them. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I think I lucked out because for some reason my Dropbox didn't get updated. So, good thing these were done last week. All right, so kind of get a background. Now we're going to move into our parasites. And where we start is with the, the phylum platyhelminthes. This is a different order than what a lot of classes would, would take. All right, a lot of classes start at the protozoans and work up. So what you would say is least advanced to the most advanced parasites. We're not doing that because we have students that need to do a project. All right, and the most likely parasites that we're going to find are going to be platyhelminths. Uh, and then the nematode, so more of our, our metazoan type, type parasites. So, uh, what we're going to do is introduce the platyhelminthes. Right. So, what is this? Well, phylum just literally means flatworms. Right. They're flat. In this group, there's about, or in this phylum, there's about 30,000 species. 
and most of these species are obligate parasites. Right? They need to be parasitic in the adult stage. Now, of course, some of these worms are free living. There are free living flatworms out there. We can go out to an aquatic system, to a pond, to a stream, and we can find some. But the vast majority of, of these worms, majority, major majority, are going to be obligate parasites. Let me know if I go too fast. So, hopefully this is review for zoology for those of you that have it or had it. If not, that's, that's review. Actually, you probably covered it in high school, believe it or not. So, these are flatworms. What does that mean? They're dorsal ventrally flattened. So, dorsal sides, the back, ventral sides, the belly, they are flattened and compressed. Why would you do that? Why, what's the advantage of being flattened? Surface area to volume. Yeah, increase surface area to volume ratios. All right. So why is that important? Nutrient absorption. Right. Nutrient absorption. Slew of slew of benefits. You know, you don't you don't need circulatory systems. You don't need transportation systems. You can oftentimes get by just with diffusion. We'll see that in terms of nutrient ac acquisition. In these worms, in these, plat these flatworms, there is no segmentation. Right? It kind of sets it apart from our anelids. Now, cestodes give the appearance of being segmented, but those aren't actually segments. Right? We consider those more modular iterations. So each proglottid in, in our tapeworm is more of a modular iteration in that each module has a complete set of sexual organs, reproduction organs. Right, and that's different from segmentation. These worms are also bilaterally symmetric. So, you know, here's the example of just kind of taken off of a website. We cut it down in half, all right? One side's a mirror image of the other. Now that's external mirror image. Internal might not have that same type of symmetry. Along with this, the symmetry, we have a clearly defined anterior end and a clearly defined posterior end. And all of these worms are acelomate. Let me fix that. Acelomate. Misspelled. Actually, not acelomate. Franken. Acelomate. So, Inside of these worms, we don't have compartments. We don't have individual uh, compartment. Uh, all of that mass between our outer and inner layer is filled with a spongy mass of vacuolated mesenchymal cells. This is called a parenchyma. All right, it's essentially like loose clint connective tissue if you've had anatomy. And that's like different from humans. Like we can get into our body cavity and it's barely dry in there. These guys, kind of a spongy mass. The digestive system in these guys is consists of either an incomplete or no gut. So the incomplete gut would be one that, like, it's a one-way sac. All right, what goes in, if it's going to come out, it's got to come out the same way. All right, or they, they lack a gut. And that kind of makes sense in terms of, of their morphology. They're, they're flat. They have a high surface area. Some of these guys can get away without having to actually feed on something. They can just absorb their nutrients. And in terms of our uh, parasites, a lot of them reside in the gut. Right? How nutritious is the gut? Yeah, they're, think of it as, as taking a bath in their soup. You know? I can't help but think, but in that, that movie, uh, Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs, the guy's sitting in the hot tub of nacho cheese. The one sticks to the guy's hair, hairy chest. That's just gross. <laughs> My kids used to watch it all the time. Kind of gross. All right, but they're, I mean, that's worms. They're sitting in their, in their food, and they just absorb it. <clears throat> Likewise, you don't really have a need for this, this drastic extra, excretory system. You don't have to transport it. You can diffuse a lot. However, they do have a primitive excretory system. That excretory system consists of protonephridium, 
also called a flame cell. Right? Its primary function isn't necessarily excretory to remove like nitrogenous weights. Its primary role tends to be osmoregulatory in function. All right, so it's going, these worms are going to be absorbing water. They're going to try to release it. This is especially important when some of these uh, platyhelminths enter the environment and have to deal with the freshwater environment. They have to get rid of all of that excess water. Now, what is this pro protonephridium? What is this flame cell? The flame cell is an actual cell right, that has flagella or cilia, and you're going to see it written as either cilia or flagella. But these flagella or cilia beat to draw a current into the actual cell itself through these slits. All right? The beating of these cilia or flagella make it look like it's a flame. All right? If you think of a candle flame or you think of some of those flame light bulbs that give the impression uh, of the beating, that's what it looks like. Now, it draws in the water and it comes through these leptotrichs. All right? Just think of them as slits in the structure of the cell, and it moves the water down the tubules. Now, some of these have, so these are collecting tubules. Some of these uh, have cells lining them that allows for reabsorption um, of some of the water. Others, they don't. It's going to be species group specific. But these collecting tubules then lead to an excretory bladder and ultimately to an excretory pore where all of that excess water goes off. Now, it's hard to see these in the adults. I've been picking up some snails. I'm looking for these in our circaria, our larval stages. These flame cells become much more prominent because you're dealing with an organism in a freshwater environment, and if it can't get rid of that water, it's just going to swell and explode. So if we can find some, we'll get some on a, uh, compressed on a slide, and hopefully we can see some of these flame cells. Nervous system is pretty well studied. Uh, actually, free living flatworms uh, have been a focus of many uh, neuroscience experiments and studies. All right, so the nervous system, both the trematodes and the cestodes, right, the free living ones might be a little different, are described as a ladder type system. It's an orthogon. Right? What we have is our nerve ganglia at the anterior end, and there's typically two of them. And then you have a two nerve trunks, usually, a uh, dorsal and ventral nerve trunk that runs down, or lateral nerve trunks, lateral nerve trunks, that run down the side of the worm. All right, some of them also have a dorsal and ventral nerve trunk, all right, but it still doesn't change the fact that we've got our ganglia, we've got these trunks that run down, and then we have these lateral commissures that connect those two nerve trunks. All right. Attached to these, these trunks, attached to the ganglia, are all these nerves that then extend to the surface for the various receptors that we have. And the receptors could be tactile in nature, so that, you know, more mechanoreception. They could be chemical receptors, and these could be, again, kind of papillae that stick out, or they're, they're likely pits. They kind of allow for uh, detection, binding of compounds. Uh, we have eye spots for light detection, and we also have statocysts. Our right? statocysts allow for orientation. Um, if you had zoology, you probably learned about a statocyst. What organism had had them? The jellyfish. The jellyfish. And you have your, your bell, and then you had you know, they describe the statocysts as being around that bell. Helps it orient itself in the water. Yeah, there, there's some statocysts. Uh, in some of these worms, all right, it helps them with orientation. So, you know, just because these seem primitive doesn't mean that they lack a nervous system. They actually have it, and for their size, you know, these are actually fairly large, uh, fair, fairly large uh, nerve trunks. Are we going to be able to see them? No, we won't. We won't. Reproductive system in the platyhelminths is basically standard. We have a basic pattern uh, across uh, platyhelminths. Most of our species in this group, in this phylum, are monoecious. What does that mean? What does that mean? Both male and female. 
Yep. Both, both male and female in the same world. Uh, I think the textbook has, has used the term uh, hermaphroditic, which is true. Uh, we've got worms that have uh, both male and female organs, and we saw that in, in our worms, in either Dicrocelium or Clinorchus. All right, now, most of these can self-fertilize. Right, so if it's just one individual, they could self-fertilize if they do reproduce sexually. However, cross-fertilization will also occur, and in some cases, the actually preferred method of reproduction. Now, most of these are monoecious, but a few of our, of our worms actually are dioecious, where you have separate sexes. One that we'll talk about is schistosoma, one of our uh, parasitic, parasitic worms uh, of humans. Now, how is sperm transferred? When, when we have, uh, when we do cross-fertilize or we have a dioecious species, how, how do they mate? Most of our worms are going to deposit sperm into the female reproductive tract, and this is the function of the serous. The serous is the male part. It's going it's to extend out of, out of the worm, go into a uh, gonopore, and deposit sperm, which then travel up or down the uterus. Depends on your view. I'd say upstream the uterus to get to you know, maybe the seminal receptacle, or ultimately get to the oocyte where fertilization could occur. Some cestodes, however, practice hypodermic impregnation. All right, and this is exactly what it says. The sears will come out, pierce the endothelial or the epithelial layer, pierce the body, and then inject the sperm right into the parenchyma. And the sperm would then find its way to the oocyte so that it could, it could fertilize those ova. All right, we'll see his reproductive structures in various worms in lab. Now, in, all, in, in the platyhelminths, right, in our parasitic species, the eggs are ectolocythal. Right, big, big worm, or big term. All right, it's in the lab manual. I, I don't know if I defined it in there, but what that means is that the egg yolk is supplied by cells other than the ovum, and that's different. Where, where does the yolk come from, from for humans? Take a guess. You think it's this? Ectolocytal? No, it's, a, it's a ova. O ova gets fertilized. Ova has everything it needs. These guys don't. This is where the vitellaria come. The vitellin glands produce, you know, produce the compounds for the yolk and substances that, that later become the eggshell. So the ova is just simply the cell itself with the genetic information. The yolk gets added by this, this extra structure. All right. Now, in terms of our trematodes and cestodes, parasitic species, asexual reproduction is common. We will see this. And this isn't asexual reproduction of our adult stage, but asexual reproduction in our larval stages. Right. So traditionally, there have been four classes. There's a class Turbillaria, class Trematoda, class Monogenoidea, and then it would be the class Cestoidea. That's all kind of gone to the trash pit, quite frankly. Turbillarians have been broken up big time. And this kind of shows it, all right? This turbillarians, they're breaking that apart into numerous classes of that form. But we've kind of retained some of the other classes, which was the class trematoda, class monogenoidea, and the class histoidea. What's notable is that these groups, these classes, are a parasitic group. The turbillarians are a free living group. And in that transition to parasitism, they all formed a monophyletic group. What's common to all of them is this transition or the development of a new type of epidermis, a new type of skin, hence their name, Neodermata. All right? So what is this sub superclass Neodermata? Well, it's a group that's defined by ectolocytal eggs. They've also lost at its ciliated epiderm, epidermis, at least in the larval stage, they've lost it. But in our adults, we have this new type of skin, 
called the syncytial tegument. All right, and we're going to talk about those that syncytial tegument. All right, so what is what are the classes? What are the groups in our uh, neodermata? Well, we've got the class trematoda. All right, in this class we have suckers as a posterior adhesive organ. Uh, we have a ma the male genital opening opens into like an atrium area. Uh, and then our adults have a pharynx that's right near the oral sucker. And that's different because in our free living, in our turbolarians, oftentimes you have a mouth like mid-body, mid like on the mid-ventral side. Now, now, that's the trematoda, and that's kind of general characteristics. We then have two different subclasses. We're going to touch on both of these. Uh, we have the spitobotherians and we have the digenega. So the spitobotherians have a specialized microvilli on and microtubules in the neoderma. So it's something a little bit different. It's probably related to the fact that some of these are uh, like a transition. This might be a transition group. All right. But notably, and you're going to see it, posterior sucker is divided into compartments. Uh, we have a name for this, this type of sucker. And then the digene. We've got myrcidium uh, as a first stage larval. We have one or more spores this stage. That's, that's our next larval, larval group. Uh, they produce our circarial stage. And then we have gut development, which is pedomorphic. So what that means is that as we get into our metacircarial stage, right, uh, that stage starts to resemble some of our adult stages. Monogenes, another class. These are primarily our ectoparasites. All right, our larval stage, or what would have been a myrcidium, takes on a new name called the oncomyrcidium. Uh, and what's notable is that our adults have a single testis in our monogenes. In our digenes, you typically see at least two testes, maybe more. And, and, the, and the cestodes, that you could have hundreds possibly in theirs. But the monogenes, they only have one. Uh, and we'll look at those. And then the cestodes, these are all of our tapeworms. Uh, and the cestodes are different. So I kind of get away from class because, again, that the systematics of all of our tapeworms is undergoing drastic revision, and they're kind of getting away from this whole class family group and starting to call it cohorts, infracohorts, and, and so forth. Some of the names have stayed the same, uh, same though. But in these, we've got uh, gyrocotyle and the cestoidea. There is one more that I've left off because we're not really going to talk, talk much about it, uh, but the gyrocotyle the gyrocotyles. I think someone's presenting that. I think someone's presenting that. Someone picked that. But uh, we're going to hear about that in our presentation and see what's different with that. Kind of a different type of attachment organ. And then our cestoids, cestoidia, that's our classic tapeworms, which you would think of. All right, we've got uh, the adult is polyzoic. That's our modular type of body. Right? It's producing all of these perglottids. Uh, we have a six-hooked larval stage uh, that it ends up being lost. So it's present in early larval stages, then, then you lose it later on. And then you have life cycles with more than one host. So there's not a single uh, sexo life cycle that is one host life cycle. And then our tegument, as, as you'll learn, has these microtreaks on here. What we're going to do is introduce, so uh, don't panic. I'm not going to ask you, what are the defining features of, of the trematodes? All right, they, these are just kind of introducing you, kind of giving you a better study guide so you can remember. If you see an unknown diagram and I say, what class is this? You should be able to recognize it as digene, monogene, cesto, and so forth. We're going to talk about this new skin, the neoderma. All right, so it came about because all of, all of our parasitic groups are monophyletic. So it almost seems like this is one of those requirements that came about that allowed our parasites to actually become successful parasites, right? that allowed our free living organisms to transition to parasitism. All right, what's different between this is that our turbolarians, the free living ones, they have a ciliated epidermis. All right. It's thought the cilia is going to help with movement, especially gliding along, along surfaces and so forth. But it's not just that. That epithelium is actually very thin, and it's a, composed of a single layer of cells, and then your cilia project from that. This epidermis includes glandular cells and then ducts 
then from subepithelial glands. So below the surface, then you have other glandular cells with their ducts coming up, ducts coming to the surface. In the trematodes and the cystoidea, we lack that ciliated epidermis. The exception is some of the larval stages. It's kind of how, how we know that, that it's still part of the uh, that turbillarians and, and these these pair these other parasites, zygenes and cestodes, are part of our of our platy helminths. All right, but if you have this ciliated epidermis in our larval stage, then though that is completely lost during our transition into the adults. And what develops is this syncytial tegument. All right, syncytial tegument is defined as a multinucleated epidermis where the nuclei are located in cytons below the superficial muscle layers. All right, multinucleated epidermis where the nuclei are located in cytons below the superficial muscle layers. And I've got diagrams coming up. All right, so just comparison. Syncytial tegument versus the ciliated epidermis of the turbillarians. Epithelium is it's thin, single layer of cells. This is a multicellular epidermis. Uh, can you go back? Yep. Sorry. Uh, yep. So multinucleated. <coughs> Cytons are also called cell bodies. Let's see it depending on what, what diagram you I believe I did, I pulled these from our textbook. <clears throat> some of these diagrams are from our textbook, some of these diagrams are from different textbook, various textbooks. But I like this one from our textbook, I thought it was pretty good. Doesn't have too much detail to really block out the main points of this table. Ready? Yeah. All right, so I've got the, I copied and pasted, got this handout. All right, so it's multinucleated. Here's our outer layer. This is, this, this is, let's say the lumen of the gut is up here. We've got our surface layer. And then you've got this layer here. This is the anucleate layer, all right? No cell membranes, no nothing. Completely anucleated but it connects to the cytons or the cell bodies. So here's our muscle layer, the superficial muscle layer. Below that muscle layer are the cytons. Connecting the cyton to our anucleate layer is, are these internuncial processes. All right, the internuncial processes basically connect that anucleate layer to the cyton. And since there's no separation, we could have another cyton over here, another cyton over here, and that means they're all connected through their cytoplasm. All right, that's what we mean by our multinucleated layer. There's no separation between our cytons. It all opens up to this anucleate layer. Now, located in the cytons, we have our nucleus, right? We've got uh, our uh, <coughs> ribosomes in there, uh, our ER in there, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. We have mitochondria there, but we also have mitochondria up in the anucleate layer as well. That's right, something that, that was rather interesting when they, when they discovered that. All right. Also in the layer, you can have spines. So the spines extend out through the surface. You can have your sensory uh, or tactile receptors, we could say, the papillae. All right. So what is the function of the function is threefold. First is digestion. All right. Since we have connections, we are going to have transcription taking place in our nucleus, sending translation products to produce, to produce excretory vesicles. Those excretory vesicles are, are going to contain enzymes and such that will be released and help to break down food that our worm can then reabsorb through endocytosis or perhaps penocytosis. All right, so 
Just because you're sitting in your food doesn't mean you can actually consume them. Sometimes it has to be broken down to a size that you can internalize it. So digestion's one of the key roles. Second key role is then absorption. So we broke our, down our food and then we have to absorb it. How do we absorb it? Endocytosis, penocytosis, I already mentioned those. We've got these pits that increase our surface area, that, in, uh, that increases the amount of receptors that we can have on our surface so we can bind and then internalize those processes, but we can also have diffusion as well. All right, so water can diffuse across, other small molecular weight molecules can diffuse across no problem. So digestion, absorption, and then our third thing, possibly one of the most important things, is protection. All right, it's serving as our protective layer against the environment that we're in. And the environment's going to be a harsh environment because the host immune system is constantly attacking it. So how does it confer the protection? It confers its protection because of the structure of this layer. It's anucleated. And right at the surface, we're going to have what's called a glycocalyx a bunch of uh, carbohydrates right on the surface. And as antibodies bind, as cells bind to start dumping their contents, this stuff is just going to be sloughed off, flaked off, and regrown. Because it's just a constant regrowing. So the sloughing off of that glycocalyx is going to act to capture the antibodies, capture these, these, uh, these receptors, they're trying to fight it, and then they're just going to get pushed away. They're going to be sloughed off, and then it's going to go down the GI tract and so forth, out of the body. All right? It's not like the antibodies can bond and say, oh, crap, I'm no longer on the, word, uh, on the worm. Let me detach and reattach. It doesn't happen like that. It binds, and then it stays bound. All right? The other part of protection is that we do have additional secretory products including polyphenols and mucopolysaccharides. These are going to be aimed at inhibiting host enzymes. So these host enzymes that are trying to break them down, we have some of these that will go out and they're going to try to bind and prevent them from attacking the worm themselves. All right, very important aspect. And that's why the diagram has this antibody glycocalyx uh, complex, just to, just to demonstrate that, yeah, you can have the antibodies bind, but because this layer is constantly sloughed off, we get that added protection. Now, is this part of, you know, did this arise because it was protective in nature? So that is the sloughing off, did that arise because of its protective nature? Or was this more of a consequence of the damage that's being done and the need to constantly replenish itself? Good question. Right? That's one of those evolutionary questions that it's kind of hard to answer. All right. Any questions? No? Nope. We got through a lot. All right. Well, I guess we can move on. So that's the, the platy helminths. Kind of background of platy helminths. What we're going to do now is kind of break it down to the individual classes. This is good. All right, so kind of get the background of what the platy helminth these are. Now let's get to some more of the specifics of the individual classes. And the first one we're going to start with is the class Trematoda. We'll do the subclass of Spinobothria. The spitabotrians. So this is a small group of parasites. Only about 80 species are known. Right, only about 80 species are known. Uh, these are all endoparasites of mollusks, fishes, or turtles. Right, again, species specific on, on what they go into. Right. But it's a poorly studied group. And I'm going to say it's not too surprising. It doesn't really have any medical importance for humans. It's not really going to infect us and cause damage. So you don't have that NIH money funding to, you know, how to eliminate this thing. 
And it's not really, you don't really have any sort of economic importance. Right? It's not like these things are, are damaging cattle so that you have the, the ag department you know, funneling money into research. So it's basically somebody looks at these worms and says, this is cool, I'm going to work on it. And then they have to find some school where like, they give them a little bit of research money because the chances that you get funding for something like this, pff, nil. You wouldn't. It's, it's not important enough. Now, we talk about it because I find this is a rather interesting group. And this group has three distinct body forms, and they're all defined by their ventral sucker. All right? That ventral sucker is going to be massive. It's going to be huge. It's going to take up basically the entire body. All right? That ventral sucker is also called the opus thapter. We're going to see this term again in the monogenes. Right? Our trematodes that we've looked at, you know, the ventral sucker is an acetabulum. Right? Some would also call that the opus thapter as well. So we've got a lot of different names. It's probably better just to say, in these spitabothrians, we're going to see something called the Bayer's disc. That is their large, their huge ventral sucker. All right, so body form number one is where this Bayer's disc is a single large sucker that's divided into shallow depressions. It's divided into these depressions by muscular septa. So here's our Bayer's disc. This is, those watching can see it. Here's our Bayer's disc right here. The individual compartments are called uh, alveoli or loculi. All right? Singular term would be, would be alveolus or loculus. All right, and what causes them are these muscular septa that separate them. All right, so these are just three different examples of that same type of body form. Where you've got this massive Bayer's disc here, and the Bayer's disc form these septa, these uh, various loculi, and they kind of act like a suck sucker. So you, you know, they attach to something and then they contract. And kind of pull up and it acts like a suction cup. Helps hold them in place. Right. And these, this diagram's on, on the handouts. Second body form is where our hold fast actually consists of a series of suckers along the length of the body. We describe them as longitudinally arranged. In you know diagram, you've got you know this is the worm. You've got sucker, 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 just down the length of the body. All right, the Bayer's disc is kind of, is the collection of all of these suckers. All right, but we don't have the loculi. You don't have the muscular suckers uh, associated with it. That's body form number two. And body form number three is where our ventral holdfast contains, uh, consists of these transverse ridges that are called rugi. Right? Kind of hard to see in this diagram because they've kind of made it so you can see the interior of the worm. But here, they kind of covered it up so you could see it, almost like accordion-like. If you put it sideways and look at it, it does look like it's, it's these V-shaped ridges, all right? You don't have septa, you don't have suckers, all right? You don't have the depressions, but you do have the contraction. When it does contract, it kind of grabs and holds on, right? If you kind of take your fingers and then kind of curl the moat up and try to go grab a blanket or something like that. You can kind of squeeze and get some, some grippage on it, but you know, that's, that's our third body form. So they're very different. This one, ventral hold fast with transverse ridges. Here's our longitudinally arranged suckers, and here's our classic bear's disc that we see. All right? So what we'll do is we'll stop here. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll go over a generalized life cycle, and then I have an example of spitabothrian life cycle that we'll, uh, we'll actually draw out on the board. So.
Once we finish this, then we'll move right. On Wednesday, we'll introduce the uh, diagenetic drug test. That will probably go through Friday, is my guess, if we, if we can finish up on Friday. But that introduction, we kind of, we hit the, the general background information for diagenetic drug tests. Life cycles, uh, reproductive organs, and, and everything. So by that time, by the time we finish that, you'll see all of the stuff that we we're looking at and have definitions of it. So, all right. All right, I'll see some of you uh, at, I guess, 2 o'clock.